So in this video, I'm going to discuss Ag Kachadorian's essay on the morality of terrorism. So the overarching question here is whether terrorism is ever morally justified, and that requires us to kind of break down what terrorism actually is and define it. Now, the author talks about how the ways we use terrorism, right, it's used in a very kind of emotionally charged biased, polemical way um, that creates some sort of like fear, some sort of threat. And he says, we need to have an objective definition. So what about state governments sponsored violence, right? Is that terrorism or do we only say it when it's stateless actors um, engaging in these acts of violence? The term terrorism is also used as some sort of like psychological, physical threat. So if you're doing something that perhaps the government doesn't want you to be doing, right, they might classify you as a terrorist. And then that could lead to more funding being used to stop whatever it is that you're doing. Um, that's actually happened with some environmental activist groups where they've been classified as terrorists. So um, oftentimes we indiscriminately label are, are as in our country's enemies as terrorists, but are they really terrorists or are we terrorists, right? So these are important questions to think about. And he also says that some definitions of terrorism are, it's too limited. If we're only say, saying that political acts of terrorism are terrorism, then that doesn't, you know, apply to, you know, other forms of terrorism that we've seen happen. Whereas other definitions of terrorism are too condemnatory, they're too prescriptive and judgmental rather than prescriptive. And he uses the example of how Reagan called terrorists base criminals. Um, and so it's a very emotionally charged way of defining terrorists. So when we think about terrorism, we have to understand the way it's defined and who's defining it and what's their agenda. So what is terrorism? The author says that all forms of terrorist acts have five conditions in common. They're somewhat vague, but they help us understand why something would happen. So the first condition is that there's some sort of historical, cultural, socioeconomic cause to the act of terrorism. So for example, poverty, colonialism, um, some sort of dictator, they don't just happen out of thin air, right? There's some sort of causality to it. The second condition is that they have immediate, intermediate, or long-term goals. So they're not just randomly doing it because they feel like it, there's some sort of agenda attached to it, whether it's short-term or long-term, like a regime change or a change in power, a anti-colonial liberation movement, etc. The third condition is that methods of coercion and force are always used. They are not being nonviolent, right? So there are the immediate victims who are targeted and attacked versus the victimized, which is kind of perhaps a larger group of people or a government or an ideology or a leader who can be more difficult to attack. And then we also have the fourth condition, which are organizations that there's always some sort of organization or institution that sponsors terrorism. So it can be the state or the government or individual actors and groups who are forming their own organizations. The fifth condition, fifth condition is that there's some sort of context social, political, economic context for understanding terrorism. Is it war? Is it peace? Is it a recession? Etc. So all of these forms of terrorism, right, have the five conditions in common where you're using coercion and force. And he's, he also breaks terrorism down into four different types. And it's important to understand the different types of terrorism in order to understand the reasoning and the causality of it. And so he says that the first type of terrorism is predatory terrorism, where you're just doing it for greed or monetary gain or land gain. The second type of terrorism is retaliatory terrorism, where someone is trying to seek revenge for doing something, right? Seek revenge on another country, for example. The third type of terrorism is political terrorism. So terrorism with the goal of political social change, a, a leadership change, etc. And then the fourth type of terrorism is moral or religious terrorism, where you have a moral goal. Perhaps you are responding to a tyrannical dictator or a regime that's taking over your land or something and killing people. So there's that distinction between immediate victims always versus the victimized, right? The, the people that they're really trying to change or the ideology that they're really trying to change. So the author then explores what whether terrorism can fulfill any of the conditions of just war theory, because in order for just war theory have to, to be met and to say that war is morally permissible, all of the conditions in just war theory have to be met, which that's even hard for a lot of wars to meet. But let's think about it with respect to terrorism. And so he says that, the author says that most forms of terrorism violate the just cause condition of just war theory, but he says political acts of terrorism and moral acts of terrorism may fulfill the just cause. 
components. So whether they might be acting in terms of self-defense, maybe they don't have a standing army, maybe they're responding to colonialism, maybe they're responding to genocide. Um, also, most forms of terrorism violate the last resort condition. So is this really the last resort? Have you done everything you can? They also tend to violate the principle of non-combatant immunity. And he says that this principle of non-combatant immunity and just war theory is always violated in terrorism because innocent people, um, the immediate victims, right, at least some of them are, are innocent. They're not all only targeting military or government officials. The question of innocence, though, does come up because we, we are distinguishing um, between acts of terrorism and war. And oftentimes the argument that makes that terrorism morally wrong is that they're that innocent people are being harmed. But we have to define innocence then. So there can be differing degrees of innocence in relation to terrorism. So if there, if there is a terrorist act that's responding to some sort of oppression, then the people involved in that oppression, right, have differing degrees of innocence. So let's say there's one country that's really powerful and they, you know, install terrible dictators in another country, and then those dictators cause, um, oppression in their country and then this can contribute to individuals wanting to act you know performing acts of terrorism then the the country that installed those dictators right are the people who live in that country completely innocent are they guilty by association um, or is it solely the leaders who are guilty but if they voted for the leaders that are guilty right what is their connection to that and so that's why the the question of innocence is not black or white there can be degrees of innocence when it comes to the moral causality of what is causing terrorism to happen the author also says that most forms of terrorism violate the proportionality rule of just war theory because oftentimes there's more destruction than benefit and there's more destruction than what is what needs to occur. But of course, if you are in a supreme emergency, it's really hard to assess that properly. And most forms of terrorism really have not reached their goals, even if even the forms of terrorism, such as political and moral, that have just cause that it's a whole other situation for them to be able to successfully reach their goals. So oftentimes, or all the time, terrorism leads to more animosity, which makes it harder and decreases the chances of these individuals or groups um, from wanting to reach their goals. So it creates more anger and more violence. Now, we can talk about just war theory, you know, all day, right? But I think it's important to also get at our moral intuitions about what makes terrorism wrong. And so he says that terrorism violates our fundamental human rights. It violates our right to life. And so in order to be, in order to do anything, right, we have to be alive to begin with. And so the right to life allows us to self-actualize and, and, you know, experience our goals and achievements and live our lives. And so this requires us to be treated as moral persons, right, as, as equal moral agents. But if we're killed, we don't have that ability. And the right to life comes with a negative right to life. Negative not in terms of it being a bad thing, but negative in terms of it preventing people from being able to kill you, right? We have the right to not be killed. We have the right to have some sort of physical and mental security, right? That's what a negative right to life comes with. And so obviously though, terrorists, they, they murder their immediate victims, right? Which always violates the right to life. And if we are going to respect the right to life, we have to respect someone's moral autonomy and be sensitive to their goals and feelings and, and aspirations. So terrorism then violates human rights and it violates our most basic human right, which is a right to life. And so that's why from the author's perspective, terrorism can never be morally right or morally justified, obviously, because it always violates our right to life as humans and as moral agents.